Welcome to the ForensicWeek.com show. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, forensic consultant, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ, Inc., and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. This is episode 14 of ForensicWeek.com. Today's spe special guest is by far the most recognized author of forensic science textbooks in this country, Dr. Richard Safferstein, a forensic scientist, consultant, and expert witness. We will learn about how an author decides what content is important to include in a textbook. Who makes that decision? What feedback, if any, does an author receive from the users of, the, of their textbooks? And then a discussion about expert testimony and how to prepare for the unexpected on the witness stand. Also, we have a friend of ForensicWeek.com and a webcast consultant who also in his professional, excuse me, professional career spent some time as a forensic chemist before moving on to his real passion as a graphic artist and designer. His name, Jim Alt. Then you may remember episode six when we had a number of high school teachers talking about um, the difficulty they have to get them up to uh, some of self up to speed. Uh, we're uh, honored to have uh, one of them back again, Emily Moore from Roosevelt High School in Prince George's County, and also maybe Suzanne Hughes from Howard County, maybe popping in later later on. So, uh, and by the way, both of them use Dr. Safferstein's textbooks, so it's great uh, to have them here. ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that always presents the truth as it features real forensic science by real forensic scientists and real forensic science teachers. Recorded and broadcast live on your desktop every Thursday evening here, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, together with all previous shows archived right on www.ForensicWeek.com. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to uh, my producer, Tim Fromm, who will tell you a little bit about how to ask questions or comments before, during, and after the show. Tim? Thanks, Tom. Um, as always, if you have any questions for Tom or me or any of our guests, uh, you can email us at forensicweek at gmail.com, and we'll respond to you or bring it up on a later show. If you're watching the show live, and you'd like to ask our guest a question and get an answer right away, you can comment right on YouTube while you're watching it live. I'll see it, pull it up on the screen, and we'll ask him live on the show. So let's do that. Back to you, Tom. All right, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who watched the show last week, uh, Lizzie Borden, Nothing But The Truth, we had a great uh, 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 group of uh, viewers. We had almost 300 uh, hits before today. It's up to 400. It was a great show except for one thing, the technical problems that we had, the um, difficult uh, uh, Wi-Fi problems up there in Fall River, Massachusetts. Our guests uh, um, were disappointed that there was that. They kept dropping out. So. We know that you wanted to hear every bit that they had to say, so we have rescheduled them for March 28th, Thursday evening during our regular scheduled time, March 28th. We will have all three guests back again, um, and uh, we will do that show again because um, it was difficult to hear them, etc., and, and it was a great subject. So uh, those of you who didn't hear it last week, well, you're going to have an opportunity. And those of you who had difficult hearing it, you're going to hear it uh, much better. So that's, again, March 28th. All of us who have taken high school and college courses know how much teachers rely on, on their course textbook to provide a, authoritative content to curriculum being taught in the classroom. But how many of us get to sit down and talk to the author and find out how that all gets done? Who is involved? What is the decision process for what text and graphics actually get printed? We have today on our show by far the foremost author of forensic science textbooks in the field. He is a pioneer of forensic science textbooks for all ages and in, in levels who will answer these questions and then tell us about his expertise and how he has prepared himself to testify in over 150 federal and state courtroom venues as an expert. He is Dr. Richard Safferstein, PhD in chemistry, former chief of forensic forensic scientist for the New Jersey State Police from 1970 to 1991. He is now a forensic consultant, has been since he left uh, the uh, State Police. 
His areas of expertise encompass toxicology, analysis of alcohol and drugs of abuse, as well as forensic examination of trace physical evidence. He has testified as an expert witness in over 2,000 cases in nearly 150 courts on a variety of forensic science issues, which include breath and blood testing for alcohol content, the effects of alcohol detection, identification of drugs and biological fluids, arson-related um, analysis, and the forensic examination of blood, semen, hair, paint, fiber, and glass evidence. He's an expert uh, in the evaluation of forensic DNA evidence also. Most known for his prolific writing of forensic science textbooks, manuals, and work workbooks for high schools, colleges, um, both here and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Richard Savistein. Richard, thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. Well, thank you for having me, Tom. It's uh, hard to believe I... I was capable of doing all of those things. Uh, <laughs> well, but, you know, you, you must be pretty old then, right? <laughs> I, I, well, uh, no comment. But uh, <laughs> I have had a, a very long and varied career and um, actually began working uh, with uh, in forensics uh, quite accidentally uh, with the old, uh, back then it was called the, uh, now it's called the ATF, ATF and E lab. But back then it was just called the AT and T lab, and that's where I got my start. And that was 1965. Oh my uh, goodness! I was in high, I was a I was a freshman in high school then. Right, and, and then I went back and uh, and uh, received a PhD degree, uh, not in forensics, because most people didn't even know what forensics meant back then. But I got my degree in uh, in uh, organic chemistry, and uh, very quickly after that. Uh, um, I was hired to uh, become the chief forensic scientist for the New Jersey State Police. Uh, and I guess the reason for it is I had two things going for me. I had some experience working in a, in a government lab as a forensic chemist. And I had a PhD degree. And believe it or not, I, there just weren't uh, many people who had PhD degrees who were in forensic science. There may have been maybe two or three of us back then. And I was pretty young. I, w I just had reached the age of 30 uh, at that point. So, um, uh, you know, it was, it was an interesting start. And I began my career with uh, one crime lab in New Jersey. We then expanded. We had a lot of federal money. Ultimately, we built four labs. And when I left, we had a staff of 90. And uh, so it was, um, it was quite an, an interesting career. But, you know, when you talk about, you know, how you get to write a textbook, um, you know, and it all sort of comes together. I don't think I could have done what I did without having the, the, the lab experience, both as a, as a bench chemist and also as an administrator, you know, running uh, um, drug analysis, toxicology, trace evidence, and all of that. And, and um, then um, shortly after I joined the, uh, the lab, uh, and I worked out of uh, Trenton, New Jersey, uh, one of the local colleges came to me and said, hey, would you like to teach an intro course in forensic science? And back then there was a lot of money being given uh, by the, uh, it was called LEAP, LEAP money, which was federal money for uh, Vietnam veterans who were, going back, who were going back to school. And many of them were taking programs or courses in what they called back then law enforcement, ultimately it became criminal justice. And... Um, so I began teaching this intro course uh, in, uh, at a four-year school and at a two-year school. I want you to know, Richard, that uh, that le those leap dollars didn't just go to the military. They went to anybody. I was a freshman in 1969. LEAA, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, they were trying to develop the curriculum in criminal justice. So if you wanted to major in criminal justice, they almost handed you money. They paid my my not only my four years of undergraduate school, but also all my graduate work with with those leap funds. So I was uh, I certainly part uh, participated in that program also. Before we go any further, let me just make sure that our audience um, knows everybody else, uh, and then we'll go in a little bit more about when you, uh, how you went from teaching into the textbook business. Uh, Jim, why don't you kind of introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a, a little about where you come from and the why, uh, why we are honored to have you here tonight. It's okay if my mic is working. Yep. 
Okay, good. Um, I came from Ohio, born and raised, and my first job out of school, I got a master's degree in chemistry, and I was so thrilled when my first job out of school was forensic chemist as a drug analyst. And of course, you had to study and go testify in courts of law. You met so many fascinating people. On the elevator ride up, you met a lot of the people being booked. And when you got into your little work area, you met a lot of the people that knew how to get them into the, you know, the prisons when they deserved it. So it was an interesting contrast for me being so young. And I graduated in 74. So, uh, you know, that makes me right now I'm 62. But one of the reasons I'm on this show is because you've created over the last 16 episodes. I guess we're on now 14. This is the 14th episode, I believe. Right. And what you've done is create something quite valuable, and I want to participate as a friend of the show to help you get the word out. And you were kind enough this week to say, come on on the show. And since you're a chemist, maybe you can ask a good question about chemistry. But I don't think the audience cares that much about it. But I do have a question for later that I think both of you could uh, you know, give me a good insight in. Okay. So talk to you Very soon. Good. All right. Thank you, Jim. Emily, tell us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to t be teaching forensic science? Tell yeah, tell us how you found out you're going to be teaching forensic science when that happened. All right. Well, hey everyone. I'm Emily Moore from Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I was actually a biology major and uh, got into teaching, teaching biology, and I found out that I would be teaching forensic science because the forensic science teacher is going on maternity leave. <laughs> so I got her maternity plans and I was supposed to just figure it out until she came back at Thanksgiving and uh, when she had twins she never came back so I had a textbook and a couple binders full of stuff that she used and uh, just kind of learned as I went and I got to tell you, your textbook. So thank you. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I remember um, uh, Emily called me up because her her now husband was a former student of mine. And said, "Could you please come as a guest?" I went there. I said, "Okay, what book are you using?" And she said, "I'm using Dr. Safasine's book uh, here that, that that they left for me, and um, that's the book we have to. You know, that's what the county had selected." And uh, she was brand new. And uh, two years later, I get invited again. Um, and uh, I was just very impressed with how she had developed uh, into somebody who was introduced to forensic science like two years ago and, and really has grasped the field um, when she needed to as a teacher. So I, I don't say that just because you're here, Emily. I say it because I truly mean that. So thank you for being here tonight. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Uh, Saverstein, tell us, how did you go from teaching to writing? Well, you know, uh, I, I had this offer and accepted, accepted it to teach at a two-year school and a four-year school. And I was uh, fresh out of graduate school. It was maybe two, three years out of graduate school. And I walked into the class. Well, the first thing I asked was, well, what textbook uh, has, has been used in the course? And I was given a, a book by Osterberg, an old book, uh, published back in the 50s, actually. And I looked at it and I said, oh, oh my God, this is not what I, the way I would want to teach the course. So here I was, I didn't have a book, and I wrote some notes up and I worked, worked off the notes. Uh, and then, you know, I said, oh my God, what an opportunity. Because, you know, when you're in graduate school, uh, as I had just been and as a chemist, there were oodles of textbooks on every conceivable subject relating to my major. And here I was. I couldn't find a, a book, and I said, hey, this is a great opportunity to create a, a textbook. Um, and of course, I was very familiar with some of the basic books that existed in chemistry and economics. I'm sure if I gave you some names, you would all, we'd all know some of these names, uh, who, that books that became you know, standards in, 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 in teaching. And uh, so I, I decided to, uh, to write a book. and. Uh, gentleman up in uh, Rutgers University at the time, Dr. Ray Murray, who's a forensic geologist, had written a book on forensic, uh, on geology, and put me in touch with Prentice Hall, and uh, they asked me to write the book. Now, Prentice, Hall, Prentice Hall and Pearson, they're the same company now, right? Yeah, Pearson owns yeah. Prentice Hall, right. Okay. All right. All right. So, all right. So, how do you decide what the content should be. I mean, did, did, did the 
did the publisher give you any direction on what they thought needed to be, or did you you could do anything you wanted? I could do anything I want in any way I wanted, and uh, there was no direction given. And what I wanted to do, two things: I wanted to write about forensic science as it actually existed, you know, as I practice it and practiced, practiced it in the New Jersey State Police Lab. So I knew what was going on in the real world. I didn't want my book to be written by some college professor from an ivory tower uh, who didn't really know much about what was going on in, in, in the crime lab. I did, and I was pretty versed in, in, in the goings-on of the crime lab. And the second thing I wanted to do was I wanted to integrate science into the textbook because I, always, I viewed this as an opportunity not only to teach forensic science, but to teach science, and uh, I wanted to write about the uh, the analytical technology that was used and the uh, the various uh, 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 technologies that we used for, for back then for blood typing and things of that nature. And I wanted to do it in a way that it was readable because I knew that the students I was going to be addressing were basic, you know, intro students. They really even weren't much interested in the career in forensic science. But since I had them in the classroom, I wanted to teach them a little science as well as a lot of forensics. And if you read my books, you'll see that I've, I've kept to that uh, goal uh, over the years. And uh, I don't think there's any book around that integrates the science with the forensics as much as I have. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Emily to talk in a moment, but I just let me just make a comment. You know, for a number of years... I, I was not, I could not use your books because my students are purely criminal justice students. They had no interest in science or being a scientist, but I felt it important for them to understand science and how, uh, so, what science could do for them as investigators and law enforcement officials. So um, I, I kept trying to use your book, but it just had too much science in it. But then you came up with the book that I'm using today, Forensic Science from Crime Scene to Crime Lab, and that is just right on. And in fact, that's how I introduced my course. Uh, we're gonna, it's called Introduction to Criminalistics from Crime Scene to Crime Lab, and all of a sudden you come up with a book, and it, it is more, it, it, it's more practical, uh, for the non-science major, so I appreciate that. Well, but, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because uh, that was obviously my my objective in doing Crime Scene to Crime Lab. And in writing the 11th edition, which isn't out yet for criminalistics, I am doing more to uh, uh, lower the volume, so to speak, on the science. And what we're going to be doing is breaking out the science subjects and we're going to call the in a, into a box in various chapters and called up inside the science so we're going to give the reader the opportunity to skip over the box because one of the major criticisms I've had of criminalistics has been just what you said too much science I really I really feel that uh, you know it's unfortunate in a country that like ours where we need scientists and we need to encourage science that that sort of situation exists in education but it does now interestingly enough when I wrote the high school book, uh, which I think Emma, which I believe Emily may be using, yeah. there, I, there I piled on the science because there I was really interested in getting to the student with science. And there's probably more science in the high school book, which is called Forensic Science and Introduction, than in any of the other other books uh, that I that I read. Do you uh, do you ever have an opportunity to hear from the people who? use your book, whether they like it, dislike it, if there's anything they uh, they wish was in it. Do you ever get that feedback? Oh, usually only when I'm ready to do a new edition. The publisher does a very good job of uh, going out and hiring uh, professors and uh, to, review, to review the book, and I, they, they send me back extensive reviews. Well, that's good. Well, em Emily has a few things she wants to talk to you about in reference to your high school book. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for including so much science in the text because um, I agree students need more science and technology. Those are the STEM fields are the ones that are growing right now. And um, in my school, forensic science is an upper level science elective. So it's important to have all of the uh, 
science and technology in there. So I really appreciate that. I think that's one of the main strengths of the book. Um, I did have one question for you, though, is if there's anything that the book is missing, and I do think that it's great, um, it's there's no real chapter on anthropology or entomology or um, identification of human remains or determination of post-mortem interval. Um, so when I teach that unit, I've had to really seek out a lot of other resources. So I was wondering why you left that out. Um, maybe if it's just something that you never worked with or um, if it's something that you didn't value. I was just wondering. Well, you know what? The, well, you're right. It's something I never worked with because we just didn't have uh, that kind of talent in the crime lab. That's, that work was sort of farmed out. In, the, in New Jersey, we did, we, it was available to us, but it wasn't under my direct supervision. And don't forget that I, I, um, by training education, I'm an organic chemist. So I, I tended to, uh, you know, to move towards the, 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 the biology and the chemistry. Well, you know, this gentleman who's, uh, who's monitoring this, uh, this uh, program uh, met with me in a restaurant a couple of years ago in, in Seattle and said to me, <laughs> you know what, you should do something about uh, death investigation. And I say, yeah, hey, you know, he's, he's right, you know. So I went out and bought his book, <laughs> read what he had to say, and bought a few other, got, to, got to a few other books, and I did put a, I think, a pretty decent chapter in the Crime Scene to Crime Lab book on death investigation, which also includes ent entomology and anthropology. Uh, granted, it's not... Uh, in depth, in depth, but it certainly goes far beyond what I did in the, in the previous editions, and that chapter will be added to the uh, Criminalistics 11th edition. And if there's ever a new edition of uh, the high school book, we're going to put that chapter uh, in there as well. And uh, you know, this raises an interesting point because how do you know what to include in the, in a book? And uh, and and you, you got to keep your eyes and ears open. And, and, and when you meet a, a guy like Tom. And he has some interesting comments, and I, I respect him. You know his his expertise. You know you you take the you take that kind of criticism very very seriously, which I did. Um, and so uh, I've I've sort of moved in that direction. But again, you, overall, you must remember that uh, my background is that of chemistry and a little biology. So that's that's where I'm coming from. Now, interestingly enough, also. Uh, I've added a chapter in Criminalistics and in Crime Scene to Crime Lab, written by another expert on computer for computer forensics, and I'm going to be adding a chapter on mobile computer forensics in the new 11th edition. So I am moving, you know, in in, in new directions, but you know, I I, I I don't want to overburden the reader. You know, I could, you know, I guess you can write a book, uh, you know three times the thickness of what I have <laughs> on, uh, on, on, on forensic science. It's such a vast subject. And, you know, you gotta, you, you got to sort of fight the whole – I don't want to bore the reader. I don't want to lose the reader. And, and, and that's, you know, that's, you're, you're always, I'm always fighting that battle. Rich, uh, we're starting to move away from the classroom now. In fact, I've been teaching my, my crime lab criminalistics course since 1980. Uh, and we have a, you know, it was a 60% in the lecture hall and then 40% in the crime lab. But um, classes, education is moving out of the classroom and doing a lot of online stuff. So starting in the fall, my course is going to be called, we call a blended learning class, where all my lectures are all going to be recorded online. And then we're going we're gonna to give the students a little bit more uh, practical application in the crime lab. So... So the way we uh, the way we're presenting information is changing. Uh, do you see anything changing on how we're uh, we're publishing textbooks? Is is something gonna uh, you know are are they more e e learning books uh, versus hard copy? Or do you see uh, is your publisher trying to get you to do something other than the standard traditional textbook? No, I think they're, they're they're not putting any any pressure on me to do anything but a standard book. But uh, I put pressure on myself, and I've included in the past number of editions uh, um, animations via uh, via the internet. Uh, uh, Prentice Hall has a uh, 
computer that allows the, allows me to put material on that, which the reader can access, and I've been very, very much interested in doing that. Uh, I noticed a lot of text, some of the textbooks that are out there don't do that, but I'm, I'm very much in favor of adding uh, animation and uh, internet material to, to the book to make it more, uh, more readable and more saleable. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, Tom, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this, but I've also uh, done a, a, a virtual uh, forensic laboratory where we have like uh, 13 experiments where the student can actually play with a gas chromatograph or do a, an awesome experiment. It's a, it's, a, it's a great thing. I really enjoy uh, I really enjoy doing that. It hasn't received wide circulation, but it's out there, and I'm hoping to see uh, most, most teachers and students uh, ad adapt that uh, virtual uh, forensic lab. Yeah, because there's a lot of professors. I'm, I've been very fortunate since 1980 in having a, having a, crime, a, a teaching crime lab. But a, a good deal of my colleagues, our colleagues, don't have that. So uh, if they don't have a virtual crime lab to work, the student just doesn't get that opportunity. Well, you know, I was blessed when I was teaching at the, at the schools I taught to gain access to uh, a, a, monos, a, a monocular Compound microscope, a monocular compound microscope, or a stereoscopic microscope. That was about all the, uh, the bio department would let me get at. Uh, I, you know, you can't blame them because the students that I I was teaching were, were not scientists, and uh, and they, they feared that the the equipment would be damaged. But you do face that kind of an obstacle uh, when you come in as an adjunct right. trying to teach a, a forensic a basic forensic science course. Right. Let, let's move away a little bit from, um, from uh, the books and talk a little bit about the career. One of the things that we do in ForensicWeek.com, it's important because we know we get a lot of high school students watching us and college students, and they don't get a lot of guidance from their, from their universities and, and guidance uh, even in high school because about, hey, I want to be a forensic scientist or I'm thinking about it, what do I do, what should I major in? Uh, and they don't get a lot of good guidance there, you know. So let me ask you, because you managed a, a large a crime lab in New Jersey, uh, what were the background, the people that you hired, uh, were they pure, did they have degrees in pure science? Uh, did they have uh, degrees in forensic science? Or what would you recommend mm -hmm. high school students uh, or college students uh, uh, in, in reference to preparing themselves for a career in forensic science? Well, you know, you must remember when you're working in the public uh, crime lab, and of course most of these labs are, are in the public domain, you still you have to meet civil service requirements. Like in New Jersey, the civil service had a requirement for X number of credits in biology, X number of credits in, in chemistry, and then they, they would uh, be, uh, they would administer a, a written test to a, to a candidate. So you're sort of locked in in that respect. Um, and you know, as the as even if, even after I left the state police, uh, there were lots of new programs that were evolving in forensic science, and uh, baccalaureate degrees in in, in forensic science and, uh, and master's degrees. Personally, I would not recommend um, a, a baccalaureate degree in forensic science. I'm a firm believer. In I get, agree. In getting a very strong foundation uh, in in chemistry. Uh, and, and biology, and uh, uh, before you you, you specialize uh, in forensic science, um, but um, but I tell I tell my students at Maryland, major in chemistry or biology and then take minor in criminal justice because a forensic a bachelor's degree in forensic science is nothing but a watered down version of the science with a lot of cr uh, criminal justice and law in, in procedure courses. Wouldn't you say that? I, I guess I would, and you can see the direction that we're going in. As I said, uh, when I became a forensic scientist or joined the state police, there were maybe two or three PhDs, including myself, in the whole field of forensic science. Mm -hmm. um, and now, just look at how many PhD uh, PhDs there are out there practicing forensic science. So you don't have to be uh, a genius to figure out the direction the field is going in. It's going to require uh, more graduate uh, degrees. Uh, most likely, I think you'll be seeing a good, a good deal more PhDs and even postdocs uh, entering the field. Um, so you know, we that's that's where it's that's where it's going, and you have to prepare yourself for that. 
I mean, just to look at these TV shows and say, oh, gee, that looks exciting. I want to be like CSI and, you know, solve crimes in, uh, in 60 minutes. Um, that's not where it's at, you know. There, you know, you've got to you've got to have a, a strong foundation in science. Very good. I know that I know that doesn't sound, um, you know, that doesn't sound very dramatic, but that's where it's that's where it's at. Uh, it's not sexy, but it's 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 what's real. It's seven. You know, it, we're already halfway through the show, and and I I could sit here and ask you a thousand questions. I I want to make sure that uh, that our guests, uh, any one of you, including Tim, you and uh, and Mark, if you have any questions for uh, um, uh, Dr. Saverstein, just just jump ahead, raise your hand so I can see that you got something, and, and we'll do that. Any anybody have anything right now? Any one of you? Yes, Jim. Oh, I'm unmuting my am I on again? I un, I muted yeah. my microphone for a moment. Good. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in the expert witness side of what both of you do. And very quickly, it's kind of confusing to me how this all lands in today's age, but specifically chain of evidence, because I know I had to study that as well. Because when you go to court, you have to say what did you do with the evidence, etc., as part of the chain of evidence. What is a little ambiguous to me is when it lands on physical versus electronic evidence hmm. and do you prove that they planned this event is it a conspiracy do you disavow do you do sort of refute testimony can you get somebody exonerated how do you prove the chain of evidence with either faulty or solid when now you're in the electronic age with the cell phone and duplicating files in the cloud and from your laboratory you do things and you say well good we've got this on our hard drive this is evidence but how do you secure that so that in a court of law they'll say yes it wasn't tampered with okay let me let me let me say before I even begin to answer that question is that uh, being an expert witness and being an author there's one thing that they have in common and that is the ability to communicate the ability to communicate. And if you want to be a, a good author, or you want to be a good expert witness, you have to learn how to communicate uh, in the courtroom and uh, in, in the classroom or wherever you're working. And m many, many people don't develop those skills, unfortunately, uh, but you need to have that to, uh, to be a good expert witness. With respect to chain of custody, you know, when that, when you when you're an expert witness, you 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 got to know when you walk into the courtroom uh, that you're going to be hit with chain of custody because most all these attorneys they all take in law school there must be a course called chain of custody 101, you know, and that's all you know that's the first thing they'll hit you with is they don't know anything about the science, so they want they want to bring you down on the chain of custody. And sometimes, uh, you know, you know, you just can't deal with it because you don't know what's happened to how the evidence was retrieved at the crime scene. You weren't there, or how it was sent to the police station, or or whatever. But what you do know is, if like with my case, when I worked with the state police, I knew where that evidence was from the moment it entered our building, over the counter, where it was marked, where it was stored, who touched it. Um, and that is important, but once it leaves the confines of the laboratory, um, there's no way that I, I could, as an expert, to deal with the chain of custody. But you're going to get attacked on that, no question about it. Yeah, my question was specifically when it gets to the electronic evidence you could find versus the physical. And it's just the issue that if you get dragged into that, you're on the witness stand and you're pulled into one of those kind of discussions. Do you believe? Can you support? And you go, but this isn't the same thing, but yeah, I'm supposed to be an expert at something, and they got me on the stand. Well, computer forensics is a whole new area. Uh, when, it, when, when you talk about electronic uh, uh, evidence, etc., uh, and it's interesting, the people who are experts in computer forensics never had any real interest in being investigators or law enforcement officers. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, and because, uh, you know, because they work on the left side of the brain, you know, investigators work on the right side of the brain. So uh, we have some difficulty because um, some of these computer forensics people they don't stay long in the business because they're not—they're not, they're not um, 
it's not it's easy stuff to them you know so the bottom line is you know they they have the knowledge and understanding to to establish those uh, chain of custodies they and and I don't understand it uh, I don't know uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Rich doesn't either because that's not our area of expertise uh, but I, I did want to make uh, make a point about author and, uh, being an author and a um, expert witness and I agree with you that you know communication is important but one of the problems with being an expert witness in an author is that when you are testifying on something the opposition attorney is going to read everything you wrote to see if you deviate from anything you wrote let me give you an example I, I was testifying in a federal court up in Delaware about eyewitness testimony in photo photo arrays all right, and um, I walk in the courtroom and sitting on on the on the uh, uh, U.S. attorney's uh, desk is my book, my 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 law book, you know, criminal investigation handbook. And I said to the to the uh, defense attorney, I says, "We got a problem." What? I says, "Because what I'm going to testify to today, which I agree, is not in my book. <laughs> it's not there. He's going to bring it up." And I'll tell you, he did. Could you tell me where in your book? You know, because because I was saying why the police did not do A, B, and C. Because one of the things that uh, Doctor um, Saverstein has, and I have my book, our checklists. You know, when you go when you uh, when you go to the crime scene to do this, you do A, you do B, C, D, and E. So the defense tends, uh, or the prosecution, either one, defends uh, uh, tends to criticize the police if they didn't if they skipped over one of the steps maybe you didn't need it but the book says you do it this way and uh, so I kind of got hit on that one and, uh, and all I said was hey it's going to be in the next edition <laughs> well, well, well look you know when you're an expert witness really the only thing you have going for yourself is your professional integrity and if you lose that you're, you're out of the expert witness uh, game now, uh, that means that people are going to look at past reports that you've generated, and they're, and, and they're, they're out there now give, uh, you know, on the Internet, or you know, attorneys can get their hands on deposition testimony, trial testimony, reports that you've written, and certainly they can get their hands on, on my book. Personally, I love it when an uh, opposing attorney brings my book in, and waves it to the jury because it just look makes me look really good. Uh, you know, the jurors can see, hey, this guy is an author and a well-known author. So it just adds to my uh, my uh, level of expertise. And in fact, I recently testified uh, in a case uh, in Pennsylvania where, at the end of the trial, uh, the a member of the of the jury came to the defense attorney and asked if she could take a copy of my book home for her child. <laughs> which, which you know, which I thought was a great honor. So I, I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to fear from the deposition testimonies I've given, the testimonies I've given in court, the things I've uh, I've written in, in my book. Um, and as I said, um, the only thing I've got going for myself is integrity, and uh, I, I'm not about to uh, contradict anything I've said or or wrote or or uh, preached in, in, in the past. Uh, and uh, in fact, quite frankly, you know, we're talking about being an expert witness, when a, a defense, when an attorney who's, who's going against you uh, brings up things that you may, be, you may not have addressed in your initial presentation because perhaps it wasn't a great issue to make in the initial presentation, I go right into it. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to answer any question, even if it detracts ultimately from the case that I'm testifying in, because I want to show the defense attorney or the prosecutor and the jury that I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm honest and I'm cooperative. And when I'm asked the right questions, I give the right answers. And even if, even if it detracts overall from the case I'm working. Uh, for those police officers or investigators who may be listening, uh, would you not agree that one of the most important things that you need to do when you're testifying is 
only answer the question asked and don't go beyond that. Would you agree with that? Well, as I said, I have a, 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 a philosophy in, in dealing uh, with the, as an expert witness in the courtroom. My philosophy is number one, the expert witness job starts in, in, in the lab or in the office where you review and evaluate the, the, the material you're presented. And that review and that evaluation must be level, it must be scientifically based, it must be honest. And once you've come to a conclusion based on your evaluation of the material that's been presented, that you could be of help to the attorney that wants to hire you and you write a report, then you know you're, you're, you're going into the role of the expert witness in the courtroom. And then when you get to the courtroom, you're going to have a pretrial um, conference with the attorney and you're going you're gonna to work with the attorney and have the attorney, the attorney ask you questions that bring out the strengths in your evaluation in your report. There's nothing wrong with that because we're in an adversarial system. What is wrong, however, is if you're asked by the opposing attorney questions that will detract from the case and you don't answer them correctly or you dodge, right. that, is, that is, in my opinion, um, uh, does, that kind of conduct doesn't belong in the courtroom. And as I said, if you can demonstrate to the, to the jury and to the opposing attorney that you're an honest guy, that, you, that when you're asked the right questions, you're going to give the right answers, even if it hurts the case that the, for the, uh, based on the attorney who hired you, I think you've got it made. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I'm just out to do an honest day's work as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as an expert witness. But as I said, the, it all begins with the review and the evaluation. You've got to look at the material that's presented to you and ask yourself, hey, using the science that I know, using good science, can I be of help? And if the answer to that question is yes, you well, you go ahead and write a report, and you're off and running. All right. You said it's an adversarial system we're in. You spent a good deal of your career on the prosecutor's side for the, for the state. Um, do you have any difficulty working for the defense? Absolutely not, because, uh, as I've said, um, I, I, when I evaluate a case, I evaluate it at straight out as a, as a good scientist. And um, I think, um, um, I, I like to tell my friends at the lab in New Jersey that I'm the best quality assurance program they have in New Jersey because, you know, uh, I get a lot of New Jersey State Police cases that come my way. And, you know, most of the time you're not going to find anything wrong. You don't have to find something wrong with a case. And I would say 90% of the time I agree with the findings uh, of the state. But if something was done incorrectly, if something it was left out, uh, then it's your obligation as an expert to testify to that. And ultimately, that will strengthen the, the, uh, the forensic science that's practiced uh, in, uh, in your state. I am sure that you know, we've, we've been reading in the newspapers about lots of sloppy things that have been going on in crime labs in, in certain states with respect oh, to- Oh, like Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, I, now, come on, I am sure that if I was practicing up there and I was given, you know, documentation uh, from by a defense attorney, that I would have spotted these things long ago and would have been in a position to testify. So a good expert witness is, um, is, 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 uh, is, is good at quality assurance. And uh, I have no, uh, no uh, you know, apprehensions about, about testifying for the, um, for the defense at all. Great. Uh, I'm going to stop you there for a moment, and we're going to we're going to move over to uh, Mark Lombard for a few minutes, and then we'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Savasine, and Emily and Jim for some closing remarks. But uh, right now, we're going to have Mark Lombard give us a forensic IQ update uh, and tell us what's going on in the forensic community this week and some uh, important things that uh, we need to hear about. Mark. Great. And uh, with that. Uh, new technologies are actually being developed and actually being used by law enforcement agencies and, and other agencies. So hopefully they won't make the same mistakes with the new technology. Um, uh, one such technology is quickening forensic analysis. Uh, according to former detective at the Ham Hamden Police Department, Peter Massey, new advances uh, will allow immediate lab testing results to speed up criminal investigations. Uh, one example of this new technology is the Raman spectroscopy 
that can be used to detect molecular vibrations and suspicious powdery substances to determine whether they are explosive or not without destroying potential evidence. Um, the, with all the new technologies being developed, Massey also says that the future of forensic science is bringing the lab to the crime scene. Mm -hmm. And with that, a uh, lot seen in many police departments now, it's similar to the Decatur, New Jersey Police Department's crime scene machine that was described a couple weeks ago in one of our articles. Uh, now the Illinois State Police uh, have been given a refurbished 19-foot van to serve as a mobile crime lab for major crime scenes. For, um, year, for years, we called the mobile crime uh, uh, the, the mobile crime lab was nothing but uh, a vehicle that had a lot of uh, uh, bags and and tape and and stuff like that. All it really was were the tools that they needed to process the crime scene. It really it was never really a lab. Right. Okay. What else we got? Right. Um, we also have uh, the U.S. Army actually just purchased a latent fingerprint develop development system from Lind Canada and it's a new system, it's a new dry non-contact latent fingerprint development system that uses a gaseous application process for discovering and developing latent fingerprints and this the gaseous application process actually eliminates hazardous carrier solvents that are used in traditional fingerprint processing methods as well as that possibility of damaging the physical or damaging physical application of these materials by dipping, spraying, brushing, and drying of the traditional fingerprint uh, processing. Okay. Um, there's also a video up on the blog. You can check all this up on the blog uh, for links to the full articles. And actually, for this one, it actually also has a video of the system being used. Uh, let's see. Next, we have law enforcement personnel and evidence technicians will soon be gaining a significant resource uh, coming out in the first quarter of this year. It's the Biological Evidence Preservation Handbook, which is the best practices for evidence handlers. So going along with evidence handling, which we just talked about, hopefully this will give them a good guide. And it's been de being developed by Technical Working Group on Biological Evidence Preservation and it's also co-sponsored by both the National Institute of Standards and Technology and also the National Institute of Justice. Okay, and we're going to be having the, uh, the National Institute of Technology uh, on the show hopefully in the next uh, uh, several weeks to talk about that Forensic Science uh, Commission uh, uh, that uh, has been established. Uh, I'm going to stop you there, Mark, because I'm looking at the clock and I do have a couple of qu uh, more questions um, okay. that I think is really important. Um, hey, Rich, uh, evidence technicians. Uh, over the years, evidence technicians were, were police officers who had a who got the assignment to be an evidence technician, and then when the CSI effect hit the hit the uh, the TV waves, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, um, all these chemistry and biology uh, majors graduated, and they wanted to be evidence technicians, and they really pushed away the police in the criminal justice majors. Do you see that to be the case? Because I, I'm, I'm, I know here in Maryland, um, evidence tech, a criminal justice major cannot get a job as an evidence technician because they don't have enough science background. What do you think of that? Well, obviously, this will vary from jurisdiction. The jurisdiction, and uh, I guess the, the trend is to move away from using police officers uh, as uh, CSI uh, personnel. I know there are a good number of schools uh, that offer courses, CSI courses, uh, to uh, to be, to become a so you can become a major in uh, crime scene uh, in crime scene collection of crime scene evidence, and you know just the the uh, the cost alone of of, of uh, maintaining. Um, a police officer, in terms of the, the the salary and the pension, seems to me putting will be putting more and more pressure on jurisdictions to move police out of that kind of work and substitute uh, um, qualified uh, individuals who have taken programs and courses in uh, CSI technology. I you know, I've, I had some students who said who did that. You know, and, and, and they they got jobs, but they said there was no upward mobility, you know, because they were being managed by the police. And so their management were high-level police uh, officers. And so, 
you know, there was no place for them to go. You know, they were an evidence technician. They were making a certain salary, and they saw no long-term career for them, and they left. I've had a number of students who were in that job and left because of that reason. Have you seen that? Well, uh, not being active in, in the crime law business anymore, it's hard for me to comment, but I remember when I was um, uh, working at the state police, uh, I was had a pretty good relationship with the Baltimore Police Department, and very early on, they civilianized their evidence collectors. And I used to be on a, a committee, you know, to uh, evaluate the individuals for promotion. And one of the ways of moving up was to move into the crime lab, if, assuming you, you had the, the right uh, education. And lots of, apparently a number of these people did that. You know, they started as crime scene investigators, took the appropriate courses, and were able to move into the crime lab. Very good. Emily, uh, any other comments or questions for Dr. Uh, uh, Saperstein? No, no. I, uh, you answered my questions perfectly. I love your book. Thank you. So all he has to do is take that chapter that he's already written with my help and move it over to the high school book, and then you'll probably be somewhat satisfied. I was actually just going to ask you for a copy of the book. I'm gonna. I have an extra copy of the book with that chapter in it, and I will deliver it to you tomorrow at Roosevelt High School. Are you there tomorrow? I'm always there. So well, I'll be I, I'm gonna bring it to the front desk and put your name on it, and it's yours. Okay. You know, Emily, what what a great way to teach students science through forensics. I mean, I think that it's a it's a uh, a fantastic way of getting students interested in science and by by God we certainly need to have more students who have that interest. But you know uh, Rich unfortunately these poor t teachers they don't get a lot of they don't get a lot of help you know they're lucky if they even have a textbook up in Massachusetts where I'm from I, I know you didn't know I was from Massachusetts but um, <laughs> but um, my hometown um, several of the science teachers were told to teach a forensic science uh, course without even a textbook. They said they wouldn't buy the textbooks for them, you know, and uh, they found it very difficult, which brings us to the fact that for all of you in, in the viewers, uh, uh, Dr. Savacine has agreed to come uh, to our um, our uh, workshop for the high school teachers, and uh, Emily will be there uh, at least portion of the time because she had some other things to do that week, but uh, you'll meet her in person, uh, Dr. Saverstein. But uh, um, Rich is going to be there um, for a, a good deal of time. I appreciate that. He, he's going to make sure that the student, uh, all the teachers who are there uh, uh, have a, an updated edition of his book. Um, and I, I got to tell you, Rich, um, a couple weeks ago when we were at the uh, – American Academy of Forensic Sciences, I, I stopped at every one of those vendors, and they are sending all kinds of material uh, in products uh, for these teachers uh, uh, gratis. So uh, it, it's just wonderful, and I'm, I'm really excited that we're going to be able to, to do this four-day workshop, but more importantly, to provide uh, them with some, some of the tools that uh, they end up having to take, uh, take money out of their own pocket to do that. So the students... Um, will ultimately uh, benefit from all that. So I thank you, Rich, and we look forward to June. And Emily, uh, I thank you also for being here. Um, uh, it's been uh, uh, it's great to have all of you. Let me uh, just uh, talk about a couple of things here, and in, in the next couple of weeks, because our time is running so quickly. This has been a great show, and time went so fast. Uh, next uh, week, March 14th, will be episode 15. We will be. Uh, for the first time, we're going to be live on Kate, uh, on location at uh, Marie Mount Hall at the University of Maryland. Um, the class um, is being uh, is the the course uh, the the show. I'm sorry, is actually being sponsored by the Criminal Justice Student Association in the Lambda Theta Thai uh, uh, Thai fraternity, um, and the in the University of Maryland Police Department. They're having a special gun safety identification and awareness program in the lecture hall. Uh, my my firearms expert guest is going to be there. And because, in uh, Rich, you probably don't know this, but uh, last month we had, uh, we had a shooting uh, just right off of campus. A student uh, um, uh, shot and killed um, uh, a roommate student. 
uh, wounded another, and then committed suicide. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, certainly dev uh, devastating to the community. And uh, of course, you know, this whole gun violence and, and assault rifles and gun control has been a big issue throughout the country, and politically it has been. Uh, but the focus of this program next Thursday is, is going to be gun safety uh, for students to be able to identify the different kinds of guns and how to make them safe and to be aware of their responsibilities um, when they see them, etc. So we're going to do the show live um, on that evening and uh, it'll be a, uh, it's going to be a technical um, um, challenge, but I think, I think we're going to be able to do it okay. Uh, the 28th of March, uh, the following Thursday, we will be redoing the Lizzie Borden uh, re, uh, rebroadcast, so those of you who, who didn't see it or want to see it, the 28th of March is uh, when we're, uh, we're going to do that. Um, so, um, with that, um, I want to I thank uh, our guest, Dr. Safferstein, uh, uh, Tom All Tom, any words of wisdom as we're starting to close up here? Well, this is a, such a quality broadcast. I'm glad you really have helped me get involved in this by saying yes to my volunteer efforts. And I hope people watching this and finding out about it just keep spreading the word because that's how more people are going to learn. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Saverstein, you got to tell and tell all your folks that they can see this show. All they have to do is go to ForensicWeek.com. In this show, about two to three minutes after we're done, it, the recording gets gets posted up right on there, and all you have to do is click on it, and you can see the whole thing over again. And uh, it'll be up there as long as uh, as long as I'm alive, anyways. <laughs> well, I'll, Tom, I'll, I'll do my best to spread the word and. and uh, Congratulations on, on the efforts that you're making on behalf of uh, forensic science and forensic science education. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, our University of Maryland student interns, producer Tim Fromm. Tim did a good job to get everybody up and running uh, today. And certainly Mark Lombard, our forensic IQ uh, update reporter. Uh, remember, ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation of the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see the schedule of all the other shows available for you to learn and be entertained with honest content. Meanwhile, tell all your friends and colleagues to tune in and watch ForensicWeek.com live every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or view any of our archive shows at your convenience right here on ForensicWeek.com uh, web page. Remember, tell your friends to be watching, uh, and please give us feedback. We're getting some feedback. When we get one email saying, hey, we like what you did, uh, do more of it, that, that kind of strengthens our, our, our ability to uh, go forth and, uh, and want to do more. So we need to hear from you. Uh, that you like what we're doing, and if you have new ideas, other ideas for new shows, we're always looking for ideas for new shows. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a safe week, and as always, thank you for watching.